but my voice is pretty much normal again. And I'm glad about that. All right. Well, I'd first like to discuss the uh, economy in the United States. You've said that we're going through a multiple stage economic breakdown. Can you expand on this? Remember back 15, 20 years ago, we used to boast that we're the consumer economy. Yeah, right. Uh, extend your credit, extend your home line of mortgage, second second mortgage line of credit, HELOC, home equity line of credit. Uh, we used to boast about it. We used to boast that we were the consumer economy backed by financial services and financial engineering. We are seeing the climax of the collapse of both. The financial, financial sector has become a gigantic asset bubble backed by uh, financial engineering, otherwise known as not so much as offloaded risk, you know, like with derivatives offloaded risk that Greenspan boasted about a year before they all broke in front of his face. But the other side is that the the derivatives are supporting the bond market. Uh, the whole world is dumping hundreds of billions of dollars of treasury bonds, yet the U.S. treasuries remain near the 2% mark. Why is that? Because we got a lot of fabricated demand. Well, the other side to the twisted formula <clears throat> as foundation for the U.S. economy has been the consumer economy, the consumer side, the consumption, uh, the retail. Uh, the United States has more uh, square footage of retail per capita than any country in the world. Well, that's going to come back down. And we're going to move toward an international average. But the result is we're going to see a lot of emptiness at malls. I don't say empty malls. I'm saying emptiness which means uh, what I'm referring to is that one in three, one in four mall locations, mall uh, stores, mall units, they call them locales here, uh, but stores will be empty. And, and we might see entire malls in the United States be converted into office complexes. I'd like to see them converted into s software development centers uh, where we're actually doing something, producing something. Uh, consumption is basically <clears throat> eating your children's organs. Consumption is basically burning your furniture. Consumption is basically avoiding wealth production, wealth investment, like business investment, starting a business, producing something, buying some equipment, investing in, in people, like in job payrolls. Consumption is the exact opposite of all that, and we're seeing a climax of this heretical insanity for the last 20 years where the United States' stu stupidity came to the fore, thinking that we could have a healthy, strong economy and, and a way of life that produces income to support households by consuming since when does a bonfire provide jobs? I mean, come on, we are just so incredibly economically stupid as a country. But, you know, it, it all starts with the Wall Street bankers that, you know, provide guidance to all this. There, there are various sectors in the United States that are just, you know, a wrecking zone. Uh, the, the energy sector is another one, Elijah. Uh, we are not going to be seeing a return to the $60, $80, $90 dollar crude oil price. I made a forecast about six months ago that, that we would play around at the $50 mark, but we would not go above it. And when we did, we would come back down very quickly, very soon, and that's exactly what's happening. My basis behind that was uh, not just the shale oil production in the United States, but Iran coming off the sanctions and dumping on the market. Well, now it's uh, uh, changed a little bit in the reasoning for the forecast. It's the same forecast, uh, sub-50 oil price, but it's it based a little bit more now on, not more, but based somewhat in addition now 
on the lack of unity within OPEC, which is a fractured and broken cartel with, with almost no significance whatsoever. <clears throat> we have an energy cartel void. It's going to be filled by natural gas led by Russia, Iran, and Qatar. Okay, so we've also got, I think, financial services, uh, which are in a breakdown mode in the United States. You can't look at the S&P stock index and say, well, Wall Street's doing fine. No, they're not. Take a look at the, the IPOs for stocks and take a look at the corporate bond issuance. And you see that Wall Street is struggling mightily. And what they did, what they did as a result in the last six to eight years during QE and the 0% climate <clears throat> is to rely unduly on bond carry trade. Borrow at the 0%, invest in the long-term bond, put on some leverage with bond futures, get a wink and a wink and a nod from the Fed that they're not going to raise rates. I mean, I don't really pay much attention to the tiny rate hikes that we have. We're, we're still essentially rounded to zero. Uh, are, are, would you say that the Fed interest rates are, are consistent with, say, the year 2000 when they were 6.5%? No, they're closer to zero. I mean, so what if there's three quarters of a percent or, or 60 basis points for a short-term treasury bill? I don't care. It's largely zero. And when you're near zero, you can use derivatives to, to hedge and produce uh, kind of a, a filter in there, a clamp filter to render it near zero so it doesn't destroy your bond carry trade. The bond carry trade is the principal source of income for Wall Street, in addition to narcotics money laundering, which you never hear about. They're making a lot of money on narco money laundering. So we've got the U.S. economy in a breakdown mode with 24, 23 percent unemployment. I mean, yeah, they're boasting now that the stock market is doing well because of the low jobless rate. I mean, the fascist heresy, I call it Reich economics. Is, is, is like in a climax mode. The jobless rate is the percentage of people who are receiving unemployment compensation insurance from states. Well, there are a lot of them are falling off. The Congress did not extend to 99 weeks. So a lot of them are falling off. The ones who fall off are considered, this is key, they're considered not unemployed. I did not say employed. They're not unemployed. Okay, so that's the key to the, uh, the jobless rate. So we got this 23% unemployment rate. I still believe that we're over 6 or 7% for the consumer price index. I mean, that's so falsified. It's, it's just a silly, amazing. So you got various sectors here in the United States that are in crash mode. Energy, I think, is going to have uh, a second round of painful losses and write-offs to the Wall Street banks. And we might possibly see a casualty among one of the weaker banks, say, at a second tier, you know, that, that might service the, uh, you know, the Texas Southwest area and, and not so much be a New York bank, <clears throat> but suffer a breakdown nonetheless. So it's interesting to see the breakdown and there is no better indication of the collapse than the condition of the malls and the graph of money velocity. <clears throat> if QE was actually stimulus, the money velocity would not be 50% below where it was when QE began. Stimulus usually means stimulus, invigoration, growth, uh, pinpricks, to, to lift. No, we don't have any of that. The money velocity is at depression levels and it's getting scary. Uh, it's the principal indicator that the stimulus didn't work. And it's becoming internationally recognized that QE is a failure and the U.S. just doesn't have the integrity or the fortitude to admit it. So. That, that's pretty much my, my spiel on economic breakdown. Now, we've also talked in the past about how countries are moving away from the dollar, and you recently wrote an article about this, and I'd like to discuss a little bit how it will impact us here in the United States. 
you talked about in your article how the the Chinese are moving away from the petrodollar. You explained that they are working on a major deal to pay for crude oil in the yuan currency. Can you expand on this? This is a truly enormous new factor. Uh, the Chinese, to be sure, for the last two or three years or more, have been kind of angry. Why would they want to use the dollar to pay for Saudi oil? The United States is not involved in this transaction. And it really speaks to the, the king dollar shadow. It speaks to the king dollar's uh, reign of terror. <clears throat> it's the hegemony. Uh, it, it's the influence. It's the pervasive presence of the dollar where it really doesn't have a role. Uh, the Chinese are angry about QE. They're, they were sitting on $3 trillion worth of reserves, the majority in U.S. Treasuries. And the United States is involved in hypermonetary inflation of the global reserve currency. I mean, any student of economics and finance would conclude you can't have hyper monetary inflation monetizing over a trillion dollars of US government debt in the same currency that's being used as the global currency reserve serving as the asset backing and foundation of the global banking system. So the Chinese are pissed off. They have been working for the last two years or more at workarounds. And the, the principal area of irritation for them has been buying Arab oil and having to pay in treasury bills. The Saudis, Kuwaitis, you know, Bahrain, Oman, they all say the same things to the Asians. You, well, you got to use treasury bills to pay here because our whole financial structure is designed around the U.S. treasuries. That's how the Arab nations, Gulf region, set up their financial structures. They got all their money, all their surpluses built around treasuries as part of the petrodollar accord. Well, that's all fracturing, and it has been fracturing for the last three years. I've been talking about the fracture as a, on a regular and frequent basis and various aspects of it, like using the phony UBS and Credit Suisse uh, legal charges and prosecutions in order to get access to the Swiss bullion banks to seal, steal the Arab gold. Okay, that was back in 2014. Uh, that's when it started. <clears throat> that was part of the early fractures of the petrodollar. That was your big hint. This is all coming apart. Well, the most recent has been the Qatar uh, focus by the Saudis, the big internal battle within the Gulf, uh, the big threat by the Saudis, which is really a, you know, an, an extra appendage coming off the U.S. military complex, uh, threatening Qatar. The irony is thick, because Qatar has a huge U.S. government, U.S. military presence. So the Saudis are threatening a U.S. military presence monarchy. <clears throat> Okay, back to the Chinese. The Chinese are now in a position, based on events that are on the table, to improve their leverage. Okay, to begin with, they don't want to use the treasury bill to pay for Arab oil. They'd rather use RMB. And the, the Saudis are saying, well, we don't want to hold your Chinese government bonds in RMB terms because we're not set up that way. Chinese are saying, change your setup. But the Chinese are now in a position to say, we're going to seek other suppliers of oil besides the Saudis that are willing to accept RMB. So you've got this 20% growth, incredible, like 20, 25% growth in the last three years of Chinese purchase of Russian oil. And they're buying it with RMB. 
and the Saudis are watching this. The Chinese have bought, I think, it's around 10% less oil in the last three years from the Saudi source. So the Saudis read the writing on the wall. The Saudis get the messages. The Saudis are still doing these frequent conferences between Riyadh and Beijing. They're not just cultural exchanges. They're business consortium meetings, you know, in investments by the Chinese in, in Saudi Arabia. Uh, the, the Chinese are, are trying to buy more and more malls in Saudi Arabia. Okay, now, finally, events on the table have enabled the Chinese to use a little leverage. <clears throat> I'm referring to Aramco, the uh, Arab American company. That's what it stands for. Aramco is the gigantic trillion dollar petrochemical complex conglomerate in Saudi Arabia. Well, they decided in Saudi land that they wanted to sell off 10% of their assets. And it's really kind of funny <clears throat> because the Saudis have been lying about excess capacity. I remember when I started the newsletter in 04, by 05 and 06, I, I started to realize that their claims of spare capacity, which just means oil production facilities that are temporarily turned off that could be turned on at any time that those were lies. They didn't have much spare capacity. And the indication that was glaring was that Gawar, way back then, turned over 90% in their water cut, which meant they're producing 90% water, 10% oil. In other words, Gawar is depleted. Now it's 98% or more water cut. And their giant oil fields are pretty much all drained, and they're left with numerous smaller oil fields. They're still producing. But the lie is that they don't have any spare capacity. And the bigger lie is their claims of hundreds of billions of barrels of oil. They're all lies. And that's why they're having a war with Yemen, to steal their entire untapped national oil and gas reserves. And the West is helping them out because Saudis are part of the petrodollar scheme. But the Western energy analysts who are watching the IPO for Aramco have concluded that the price is wrong by a factor of four or five. This has never been seen before in the history of the energy market. They're comparing to ExxonMobil. They're comparing to Rosneft. They're comparing to Dutch Shell. These are the giants. And they conclude that Aramco is not worth $2 trillion. It's worth something like $400 billion. So if they sell 10%, they better adjust the price. Now, here's where China comes in. The Chinese might say to the Saudis behind the curtain, behind the tent, they might offer the, the Saudis uh, an extra vig on the investment for a Ramco stock. They might offer them 50% more than it's really worth. In other words, they might offer something that, that's not four times overpriced, but just double overpriced. Why would the Saudis invest in a Ramco and overpay? Because then they could dictate some Gulf region political decisions. Because then the Chinese might say, we're a shareholder, we're a board member of Aramco from our significant investment, and we're going to grant ourselves the right to buy Saudi oil in RMB terms. And then the whole set of dominoes begins to fall. It, it, I think, is going to be the most significant event <clears throat> pardon me, behind the petrodollar collapse, which is well along. Now, if you've got 40 years of the petrodollar in existence with all its structural makeup, you're not going to break that down and kill it in two or three years. You're going to break that down and weaken it severely in two or three years but it awaits a climax event. 
The climax event could be the Chinese buying Arab oil, not just from Saudi, because when Saudi neighbors see RMB is used to buy Saudi oil, the other nations like Kuwait, Oman, and Bahrain, they're going to say, all right, that's fine with us too. You can use RMB to buy. And, and that's just the seller side. Then you're going to get the buyer side. You're going to have neighbors to China in the Southeast Asian area in the Pacific Rim. I don't want to name nations because I don't know exactly who it's going to be. I think they're going to line up three or four of them and say, we want to use RMB too because we're changing over our banking system and we're getting rid of treasury bonds at a rapid rate. And we'd rather, we'd rather use Chinese government bonds in our banking system and buy oil with RMB and back it up with those RMB bonds in our banking system and not the treasury. So this is how things break down. So how do you see this all impacting the balance of power? You know, will then power be removed from the United States? Definitely, because if the dollar is not used for oil trade on an exclusive basis, you're going to see an acceleration of the already high heavy flow torrent of treasury bond dumping. That's very apparent to Wall Street. They write about it. They're worried about it. And I think they incorrectly believe that the U.S. will respond effectively with the Fed actions and hidden QE. That's what's supporting the Treasury bond now, hidden QE. I mean, they talk about 40 and 50 billion a month. I tell you, Elijah, it's, it's one of the biggest lies in the history of U.S. finance. It's more like a trillion a month. It, for, for actual Treasury bond purchases, it, it's probably at least 200 billion a month to cover all that's being dumped and to cover the U.S. government bills. We're having, ex having an acceleration of the U.S. government deficits right now. We're setting monthly records. Where are the buyers? There aren't any. They're dumping. So why isn't the U.S. Treasury bond <clears throat> uh, sporting a yield over 5 or 7 percent? Because the Fed's monetizing it. They're using hyper-monetary inflation to cover the debt of the custodian nation's government that has the global currency reserve, which is used in the global banking system. This is heresy. This will not stand. Okay, the bigger expense that, that covers what I call the, the two to five trillion a month uh, is for derivatives. Uh, and it, it's very hard to explain it all. And to be honest, I, I don't understand it 100%. I think I understand it like 50, 60%, which is sufficient to make some conclusions, but it's not sufficient to make excellent explanations. When countries dump treasury bonds, it causes a leveraged reaction behind the curtains. And the leveraged reaction involves the huge structure of treasury bond derivatives and leveraged uh, entities like the, which are supported by the Department of Treasury's Exchange Stabilization Fund. And I believe the core behind that is $3 trillion at least of Saudi Treasury bond reserves that we refused to make available to their country. You can't tell me that the Saudis had 100 to 200 billion a year in surpluses for 30 years yet they have only 150 billion in surpluses now. I mean, I, I, I'm pretty good in mathematics, if you know what I'm trying to say. Uh, I'm pretty damn good in calculus. I'm pretty damn good in the mathematics that are above calculus. So when it comes to basic arithmetic, you morons in Wall Street and Washington, uh, we, we figured you out. The Saudis had three to five trillion in treasuries sequestered and stolen. And the only big question involved is whether it was part of their agreement back in the 70s. Were they told you have to fortify the exchange stabilization fund with regular and frequent contributions? You know, like 
50 to 80 to 100 to 120 billion dollars a year in order for the United States to financially rig all the markets. Was that the deal for the petrodollar? The recycled petro surpluses? That is precisely what I think the deal was with the Saudis. So the, what, what's the balance of power that you had in the question? If the dollar is not used for oil trade on an exclusive basis, then some momentum is going to build for the dollar not to be used in general trade, like for grain shipments, like for cement and lumber shipments, like for coal or copper shipments, like for international contracts. And the example I like to give is the Indians make a, an information technology uh, contract with an Arab nation like the Saudis for their health industry and it's a billion dollars a year paid in dollar, the contract written in dollars. Okay, I've been hearing for the last several months, not too much in the last few months, I've been hearing about a huge treaty where international contracts uh, written in dollar would be converted into written in gold. And the basil bunch of corrupt central bankers, that hive of uber lord bankers, they're part of this negotiation toward a global treaty. It would be to convert all international contracts written in dollar, like, you know, commercial trade, purchase of oil, lumber, coal, silver, copper, international contracts for services, all these international contracts written in dollars. Uh, I'm told that the negotiation is to rewrite them, convert them into gold. And to do so at, at a five to seven thousand dollar price, so it's causing a big snag, because the U.S. and the British banks are realizing that as soon as that is enacted, the dollar is dead. So that treaty might be one of several parts for the global currency reset. <clears throat> as less and less dollar usage in trade settlement is realized, you will see a massive dumping of treasuries in global banks. And that will essentially mark the end of the dollar's status with the global currency reserve. It has two sides, using the dollar in trade settlement for pay payments and using the dollar in banking reserves for core assets. The two sides, trade and banking. When that is evident for less and less dollar usage in both trade settlement and bank reserves, you will see the pressure for the U.S. economy <clears throat> hitting at a screaming high level because the threat will be for import supply. That's where the big threat is, Elijah, and the threat of import supply cutoffs or reductions not so much a halt as a much slower flow. It'll result in shortages in the United States economy, but it'll also bring about pressures to create a new currency. And I don't know that these new, I don't believe that these new concepts like the, the SDR bond out of the IMF, the International Monetary Fund, I don't think these SDR bonds are gonna be the solution that assures the continued flow of import supply to the United States. I don't think it's going to solve their problem. The only solution is going to be a new shice dollar. And I don't know if you want to get into that whole topic, but the new shice dollar, a very rough cut, will be a devalued currency that continues in the pressures for devaluation because U.S. fundamentals are so wretched. You can't have a $500 billion annual trade deficit without continued devaluations. You can't have an annual one and a quarter trillion dollar federal deficit that needs to be funded without a continued pressure for devaluation. So these are going to cause a lot of pressures for the United States to bring about a different currency because 
if the dollar is rejected internationally, it's going to cause problems for the import supply chain to the United States, and they've got to solve it, or else there's not going to be much moving in the import supply chain. It's going to bring about inflation, supply shortages, and a lot of civil disorder. Nice way of saying riots is civil disorder. Now, I'd like to get to viewers' questions. There's this one viewer's question that has to do with exactly what you're talking about right now. They ask, as a retired American, I'd like to hear your analysis regarding the immediate impact of a dollar collapse on citizens living in the city. That is, do you anticipate riots, disruption of the food chain, shipping, etc.? What will be the role of bartering using tangibles like silver? How long will that last? Finally, as societies are reestablished, what will be the relative value of gold and silver to buy a medium-priced home? Let's just start with the first part of the question. What do you think the immediate impact of a dollar collapse will be? I've never talked about a dollar collapse, so your whole premise on the question has nothing to do with what I've been talking about. I've been talking about a dollar vanish. Okay, this is one of the often done misquotes of my analysis. I have been saying steadily, like a song that doesn't end, the dollar will rise, 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 stall, and then vanish. I have never talked about a dollar collapse. So please don't put words in my mouth about my forecast, which I have never said. Okay, so the question is, let me change the question. When the dollar vanishes, what will the pressures be? Okay, when the forces build, <clears throat> whereby the import, it's exporters abroad constituting the U.S. imports. Okay, that's it. So, you know, you, you get import, export a little bit messed up. Their exports are our imports. Okay, when they start to reject the dollar, they're going to be making comments like, uh, we'd rather receive Chinese RMB for that shipment that goes to Staples or Target or Walmart. We'd rather get euros because they're less dangerous than dollars. We'd rather get gold trade notes because those can be worked you know, with, with eventual gold shipments on a net basis and you know, it's a whole lot safer and, and with a, a more stable core. Because when you do a shipment, you put down some equity. And, and the equity currently is treasury bills. Okay, so in, in this society, he talked about rebuilding society. No, you don't rebuild society. You continue to see it degrade. We haven't had the climax of the degradation of the U.S. society yet. You don't rebuild the U.S. society yet because it has not fully degraded and deteriorated and been wrecked. The households now are being wrecked. You got more, uh, a higher percentage than ever seen in US history of adult children living with their parents. They lose a job, they move back home. I actually moved back home uh, 20 years ago to my parents' home for a year. And you know, it was an interesting experience. I, I helped them out because they were aging. You know, I shoveled the snow and I went to the supermarket, did stuff like that. Uh, the breakdown of the U.S. society is not complete. We're not rebuilding Jack yet because it hasn't fully climaxed. The impact on the U.S. society is going to be empty shelves, not completely empty, but you go to Walmart, you go to Target, and you see a third of the aisles are empty. And some of your favorite items are not there. And you go to Sam's Club and you, you see the same thing. You go to Staples, you see the same thing. You go to Best Buy, you see the same thing. You complain that you, you wanted to buy this particular stereo made in Korea, like Samsung, LG, and they tell you, well, I'm sorry, we, we don't have that Korean supply line anymore. And they don't tell you. Why? They just tell you we don't have it. You read further in, in competent journals and you'll, you'll learn, for instance, that these Korean conglomerates don't want treasury bills and payment anymore. They want RMB because it's more stable. 
because they're not printing RMB to cover their government debt. Monetizing, like a South American or African country does. Now, will there be barter? Yeah, there'll be barter. Now, he mentioned barter of, of using silver to buy things. Well, that's not barter. That's using silver as a form of money. That's using silver in, in lieu of money, which would then therefore be a manifestation of its monetary role. It's an interesting distinction. In other words, silver might return to its monetary role. I have a saying, it's not a joke, it's a saying, that there will come a time when silver is used to buy food, to buy hardware, to buy clothes, to buy gasoline, but gold will be used to buy a home, to buy a business, or to pay off a large debt. Gold and silver. Silver for the street, gold for the big, the big building. Um, other forms of barter. Let me just explain something about, about barter so people have a better idea. It's a, it's a word thrown around with, with, without a lot of great comprehension. 300 years ago, 350 years ago, in the area now called the United States, there was a lot of barter. They'd go to trading posts. Chicago and St. Louis were two of the, the very largest trading posts in the world. They would trade beaver pelts for food supply. Okay, that's barter. But it's also a manifestation of beaver pelts serving as money. How many beaver pelts do you have saved up in your shed? Because they're going to be valuable when you go to the trading post. That's a form of stored value, i.e. money. <clears throat> the example I'd like to give is from my sister. I, I, I am happy to say that I have a, uh, a detente and a rapprochement with my sister in the last month because of various things that have happened in the family, like my father's deteriorating health. He's, he's closing in on 100 years. So the patriarch of the Jim Willie family is, is really, you know, he's falling apart. Uh, and it's causing some some family stresses and family needs and discussions. And my, my sister has softened her position on some things, and so have I. And I, I, I prefer to speak of my sister in a more kindly light. Well, here's something that she has done as a divorce attorney in Pennsylvania for 20 years or more. She's doing very well as an attorney. She's a partner in a firm. Uh, I could go on in, in praise of her, her status, but she's doing extremely well and being recognized in her trade. She has done barter. A guy will come into her office, and this happened in the 90s, 1990s. She told me about it and kind of giggled, and she said, Jim, it works. <clears throat> a guy would come into her office and say, I need a divorce. Uh, you know, forget the reasons for the divorce. There's a divorce. There's a cost. There's a procedure. There's an asset distribution. It's just the standard thing. There are kids. So there's custody agreements. But it turned out a couple times that there was a plumber. He said, I don't have $2,000, Chris. What do I do? And she said, well, how about if we set up a deal for the next three or four years because I have some plumbing needs in my home and I, I need some new toilets and I think I need a lot of new basic plumbing in the basement for the feeder lines. And I think it's going to be at least $1,000, so why don't we start with that? So I'll do your service and you provide me with, say, we'll just start it off at $1,000 of bartered service for plumbing. And then a couple of years later, an electrician came along. And she doesn't have as great electrician needs. But then a carpenter came along. And she wanted to remodel her basement and put paneling on the walls and put a little center there for dancing and you know, put a little stereo over on the side and you know, put it into the wall with a ledge. And, and 
Okay, you get the idea. Plumbing, electrician, carpentry. She bartered for legal services. Okay, not everybody can do that. Uh, I, I, I could do some bartering, uh, like for a subscription service in return for uh, bicycle maintenance. You know, it, it doesn't amount to $200 a year. Uh, my main bicycle expenses are for inner tubes because I think one of the national sports for Costa Rica, especially in their urban centers, is to toss glass bottles out the window against a cement wall or a brick wall or a stone wall and have a lot of fun while they're drinking and driving. I think that's one of their national sports because when I'm riding my bike along, I am continually focused on glass, glass shards on the sidewalks and the streets. You know, when a cars, when, when hundreds of cars go past, it gets pushed to the side of the street or avenue or boulevard. And that is exactly where bicycles run. So I try to go on the parallel roads. Anyway, my main expense is bicycle inner tubes, and I probably buy six or eight per year. Whereas in the Boston area, I would buy six or eight per decade because they didn't have a national sport of throwing glass bottles out the window while drinking and driving. It's a, a form of, of social protest in Costa Rica that is abhorrent. I can't do barter. Other people can. Uh, I think we're going to see springing up community consortia, consortiums of barter, where you join a barter club and you can have a list of services like plumbing, electric, and carpentry. Now add on, say, clothing, because one of the people in the barter community has a clothing store. Now add hardware, because one of the people in the community for the barter owns a small hardware store. Now add office supplies, because one of the people in the community barter center has a office supply store. Okay. So you get the point. Barter could become a community venture. Join the barter system with a, you know, ABC neighborhood, and it's a large neighborhood with 100,000 people, you know, a section of a city, and you can buy things and sell things because you might fit into the barter system for the service you provide. But if you don't provide a service, don't provide a product, you cannot join the barter system. Okay, that's how barter might spring up. And my sister is way ahead of the curve in that, but she told me a few years ago, Jim, I don't do much barter anymore because I don't need much anymore. I just, I just turn them toward uh, like a public defender who will do it for free. And then they have to get, you know, the lower quality work. But sometimes it's not a real difficult case. It just has to go through the procedure. I think silver might become a coin of the realm a lot more than gold because silver will be more valuable in the daily life demands that will become critical. I'm talking about food. I'm talking about supplies basic supplies, like socks, like a shirt, uh, like, like a piece of wood. Um, it, it, the, the gold coins, they better come down to a tenth of an ounce. I mean, Canada's way ahead of the curve on this. Canada, for the longest time, had one-tenth ounces. I had an opportunity in 2009. A client came by, said, Jim, I'm a client of yours. I've been a hat Pardon me, Hetrick Letter subscriber for two years. And uh, I want you to take a look when I come to town. I said, okay, sure, I'll be glad to meet you. He did come to town, and he showed me um, he had 500 gold coins, gold ounces. But among them, something like 50 ounces were in the form of one-tenth ounces. So he had 500 different one-tenth ounce Canadian gold coins. And I said, wow, they're cute. They're, they're, they're really nice. They're about the size of a U.S. dime. They were pretty. They had pretty much the same markings as the Canadian maple. But I didn't personally buy any. 
He said, no, unless you're going to buy a, like several thousand dollars worth, like, like $20,000 worth, Jim, I don't want to sell you any. I said, OK, because I was going to maybe buy 1000 He said, no, I don't want to. I don't want to divvy it up like that. OK, the, he said he, he actually said to me, one day we're going to have demand for these one tenth gold coin, one tenth ounce gold coin. We're going to see demand grow. We're going to see them grow in popularity. We're going to see them in wider usage. And I said, yeah, I can see that. I mean, right now it's worth a little over a hundred dollars. Like, like back then it was about fifteen hundred dollars for gold price. Uh, what did the guy do? He took his five hundred coins. He went to Panama, sold them all in one month. Uh, there was no place in Costa Rica to sell it. They have no market. But Panama is a huge financial center, and it's got a huge import export center, and it has a huge banking sector, and it, it's just it's not just the canal, etc. Oh no, it's a lot more than that. It is pretty much the Switzerland of Latin America. I don't say South America. I say Latin America because they've got a lot of counts from Mexico, Guatemala, Salvador, Costa Rica, Nicaragua. Not so much because it's very poor. But uh, you know, it's it's a it's a big it's a big center there in Panama. Okay, that that's my spiel on on barter. Uh, I hope that serves a purpose because barter is going to become big, and and the biggest high level barter. Last point. Very high level barter has been not will be, but has been for the last few years between China and Iran. They just establish contracts and say, well, we'll supply the oil and gas, you supply the finished goods, cars, motorcycles, television sets, stereos. And Iran and China have a good deal going, and it's several billion dollars a year in barter. Well, gosh, why do they do that? Because we set up sanctions against them. And they don't roll over and die. They react and do workarounds. Iran is the most successful global player in U.S. sanction workarounds and has become somewhat a model for the Eurasian trade zone to follow. Barter at the high level between nations, barter at the low level in neighborhood communities.